Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this afternoon's session on the Accessible Information Regulations. I'm Tim Rivett, uh, and I'm going to take you through the uh, the, the regulations, um, why uh, we need to have them, um, and uh, talk about the support that is available and going to be available. Um, and then uh, we'll open up for questions. We are recording this session so that um, those that couldn't make it can uh, still get the benefit and you can uh, come back to it uh, later when you uh, need a refresher or share it with colleagues and things like that. So um, why have the accessible information regulations been brought in um, if you're uh, got some form of uh, disability or impairment be that visual you've got some form of hearing uh, problem if you've got cognitive or learning impairments then uh, not knowing where you are and where you're heading uh, can be a really anxiety inducing experience um, even as uh, somebody that is nominally normal um, without any obvious disability um, if I'm traveling somewhere that I've not been before then actually I know my stress levels are high so uh, I can only imagine what it's like if you uh, aren't aware of uh, everything that's going on um, and uh, some survey work that the guide dogs for the blind carried out in 2014 um, identified that 70 percent of people with visual impairment had missed the stop that they were supposed to be getting off at after having asked the driver to uh, to let them know when they were at a particular stop drivers you know, they've got a lot to do um, they're human, they're going to forget these things. Um, and you know, if uh, somebody with uh, an impairment misses their stop, then you know that's quite a big deal often um, because they won't know where they are. They haven't got the vision or the hearing to be able to ask questions or look things up in the same way that uh, other people have. And so um, that's a real problem for them. Um, and um, we know that people with disabilities make far fewer uh, trips than um, uh, other people. Um, and uh, and so the uh, the guide dogs work showed that 68% of people with the disabilities would use the bus more frequently if there was audio visual. Um, opening up a whole range of uh, opportunities for them that they don't otherwise have. So it's really important to uh, help uh, people get around. And they, you know, we know that significantly fewer journeys are made by people with disabilities. Um, and um, in London, um, those of you that have been down in there in the last 15 years or so, you will have seen audio visual equipment on the fleet um, and if you've made a rail journey on new rolling stock since 1998 so 26 years um, you will have had audio visual announcements uh, and benefited from that so you know that's the 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 why it's really important to help people travel um, and the reason that the regulations have been uh, bought in is uh, the last set of figures, which are 22-23, uh, showed that outside of London, only 29% of vehicles in England were fitted with audiovisual equipment, Wales 37, Scotland 35. But all of London vehicles have, and they have done for a very long time. And so the market uh, was deemed to be not meeting the requirements of uh, travellers and so therefore what happens when you've got market failure governments step in and do regulation so that's why we've got the regulations um, 
So the accessible regulation information regulations have been brought in as part of the Bus Service Act 2017. It's the same act that introduced the open data regulations in 2020 that have led to the Bus Open Data Service. Um, these have been brought in later because the uh, consultation process and working through the uh, solutions has been uh, taken a bit longer than uh, for open data. Um, and they require almost every local bus or coach service to provide audible announcements and visual display of some key bits of information uh, on the route uh, and at the start and end of it and for diversions. So um, the regulations apply unlike the open data regulations to England, Scotland and Wales, uh, not just England, Northern Ireland subject to a different regime uh, but they're in the process of uh, implementing audio visual across the uh, fleets in Northern Ireland with uh, Department of Infrastructure funding. Um, but uh, so this isn't just about England for a change, this is England, Scotland and Wales um, and um, Transport for Wales and Transport for Scotland are uh, behind this uh, work and on board with it. So um, it's not an entirety outright every vehicle um, in the same way that lot, a number of other accessibility uh, and other similar regulations don't apply to every vehicle and every type of service. So if it's a very small vehicle, sort of large minibus sort of size you know as long as you've got under 17 passengers um then or 17 seats i should say uh, you could have a double decker with 15 passengers on it you need to have that vehicle equipped but if the vehicle can't cope with uh, more than 17 passengers then it's exempt um if it's a old heritage vehicle um if it's the often exempt closed door type services and long distance services um, and community bus services and um, uh, DRT type vehicles um, if they're operating um, before uh, October last year when the regulations uh, kicked in then you don't need to uh, meet the requirements but you do if you've got vehicles that are being first used after October last year and that's one of the increasingly common questions that we get um so um the regulations kick in in a phased way based on the age of a vehicle and this is when the vehicle was first used not when a particular operator first used it, it's when it's first used for a local public service. So uh, if it's a new vehicle uh, from October this year, it's got to be first use, um, no excuses there. If it's uh, first used on local public service after October 2019, then you've got until October this year to comply so not many months now if you've not started to think about it and place orders and things like that um, and then um, for 2014 vehicles onwards you've got until October next year um, and for the oldest vehicles from 1973 onwards you've got until October 2026. If your vehicle was first used before 1973 it's classed as a heritage vehicle and so they are exempt from the regulations. Although uh, people are encouraged to equip the vehicles uh, if they can. So that's the requirements. If you haven't got any form of audio visual equipment on your vehicle at the moment, if you've got a vehicle that's got 
equipment on at the moment and uh, you know 29 percent of vehicles in England have then um, you can uh, class that as a partially compliant vehicle if it is providing audio and visual information um, you, what you don't need to do is um, provide it in exactly the way that the regulations uh, ask for uh, as long as you are providing information audibly and visually so uh, if you've got a vehicle that was equipped before October last year when the regulations started then um, check whether or not it complies with the requirements and we'll look at those uh, in a second um, and see whether you need to do anything um, if you decide you don't because you're providing audio and visual information then um, if there are any you know little uh, inconsistencies and uh, non-compliance things then you've got until October 2031 to get those up to standard um, why that long well given so many vehicles haven't got any form of equipment on at the moment and providing service uh, the feeling was that we want operators to focus on getting vehicles that haven't got anything fitted and up to scratch rather than um, necessarily having to do lots of rework for uh, equipped you know vehicles that are partially compliant already so what do you need to do you need to provide audio information um, and that's got to be intelligible and understandable for 51% uh, of passengers when they're seated um, so if you've got a double deck vehicle you need to be providing audio information uh, and the upper deck as well as the lower deck and it's got to be uh, intelligible and the way that the regulations identify that is through um, a effectively volume above the background noise level in the vehicle um, there are other ways of doing it. For example, rail has a particular intelligibility test um, to uh, make sure that what's being spoken is understood, but that requires some complexity um, and it's not quite as simple. And so to make it as easy as possible, the requirements are that the um, audio has got to be uh, at least three decibels over the background noise. Now that for some vehicles, you know, a older diesel vehicle going uphill in a very hilly area, that might be a challenge, um, but it is achievable. Um, you need to be able to prove that at five miles an hour and 20 miles an hour. Um, and one thing to watch is that you're not supposed to make the announcements louder than 84 decibels. Why 84 decibels? Um, that's because that's the uh, level of noise that somebody shouldn't be um, subject to in a working environment for uh, any length of time and so uh, not wanting to uh, get to the point where bus drivers have to have hearing defenders and other you know audio protection and things like that so uh, that's where 84 decibels comes from as well as um, the announcements being made in an audio audible way through speakers um, it has also got to be provided through induction loop so um, a lot of hearing aids have uh, what's known as a T-switch, which enables um, uh, information to be provided direct to the hearing aid um, rather than um, through uh, the uh, you know, normal uh, hearing mechanisms. Um, you'll often see them in uh, banks and shops and things like that around till areas and things like that. Um, and it's fairly standard issue for uh, hearing aids from NHS and things like that. Um, so it's got to come through the hearing loop. Um, but because it's quite challenging to install 
the cabling necessary for these the requirement is that it covers the uh, priority seating area and wheelchair space um, and you've got to tell people it's there by uh, putting in place the uh, appropriate signage similar to um, the uh, the one that's uh, on the slide um, so people know it's there so you've got to provide audio and then you've got to provide uh, visual information so you've got to provide that on some form of screen again the requirement is that it's visible to 51 percent of seated passengers now that's without standing uh, if you've got a full bus and you've got all the seats occupied and people standing in the aisles and things like that then um as you know you can um reasonably um expect that some people won't be able to see because there'll be people in the way and things like that uh, so that's why the requirement is 51 percent of seated passengers um it's got to be of a minimum size 22 millimeters because uh, the you know normally these displays are installed towards the front of a vehicle and if you're sat uh, towards the back then you need to be able to see it and uh, that's generally you know so a number of different metrics um the the sort of a readable uh, height character at a at the sort of distance you're going to get on a bit on a bus um, there are other requirements linked to the readability of flat text so it shouldn't all be in uppercase so it's got to have a decent contrast with the background and things like that um, now the requirement um, for existing vehicles is that seated passengers who are facing forward can see the display for new vehicles first used after October this year you've got to be able to provide some form of visual information to uh, a wheelchair user who is uh, in the wheelchair bay and typically that will mean that they're facing backwards so a additional forward facing display is likely to be needed um, that doesn't have to be the same sort of display that's used for um, in the rearward facing um, mounting um, but you've got to provide something for that wheelchair user that is uh, that's readable for them so what information do you need to provide you need to provide information about the route and so when somebody is boarding, they need to be able to um, identify the name or the, the route number of the service, um, depending on uh, what you call a service. And they need to know where that service is going. So either the destination of it or if it's a circular service around a you know, ring road or a city or something like that then which direction it's going in uh, anti-clockwise clockwise whatever whatever is going to give people um, enough of an idea about where it's going to take them to enable them to uh, know that it's the correct route that they're on so that's got to be being announced when, when the doors are open so people boarding um, can hear it and see it um, to to help them with that decision um, and you also need to tell people before you get to the last stop that this is the last stop and they're going to have to get off um, and that announcement needs to be um, preceded by some form of alert it's not specified whether that's a bell or a buzz or whatever but you know it's something to uh, help people identify that this is not what normal information is being presented so perhaps they need to pay a bit more attention and then um, as the vehicle is going along its route um, we need to be announcing all of the stopping places that the vehicle um, may stop at um, so this is the next scheduled stop 
Um, doesn't mean to say that it's only um, the stops that the bus is stopping at. This is whether or not it's going to stop um, and the announcement needs to be made sufficiently early enough that somebody can go, aha, that's the stop I want. Uh, find the bell and press it and allow the driver to stop safely without having to do an emergency stop and all of those sort of things. Um, so that in on some routes, particularly um, as they are heading out of uh, town centres on, uh, you know, with little traffic, you know, you might be going 30 miles an hour, there might be a stop every few hundred metres that can in some cases be challenging and need some tweaking of timings and things like that. Um, now, the stop name that's used um, and announced needs to be consistent with other information. Um, the regs don't specify exactly what that should be other than it needs to be recognisable and consistent. So uh, if there's a name on the bus stop, on the flag, uh, and on a timetable and things like that, somebody that's looked at those before should be able to recognise the stop name that's being announced on the vehicle. Um, and in a lot of cases, that might mean uh, an operator working with other operators and authorities to uh, come up with um, a consistent and acceptable name for everything. One of the reasons for the requirement for consistency is to overcome this um, and to start to try and address the, the differences in bus stop names that are used across different product sets and things like that between operators and authorities, which we know is confusing to customers. Uh, in addition to uh, the uh, the stops where you've got a section of hail and ride, then you've got to um, announce the start and end points of hail and ride. Um, this again is something that needs to have an alert before it because it's a bit different to the regular heartbeat of the next stop type information. Um, and um, whilst there's no requirement to do anything other than announce the start of the hail and ride section and the end of it, um, if it's uh, of any reasonable length, then it's going to be useful for passengers to have some form of um, uh, information about how the vehicle's progressing along that section. So, you know, there are some routes uh, in rural areas where the hail and ride could be you know, a few miles long between villages and things like that. And so you know, some form of, you know, we're now passing um, this village, we're now you know, passing this side road, that sort of thing to help people who may want to uh, get off a vehicle, uh, have some idea about where they are along that section. Uh, it's not mandatory, but it will be very helpful for customers. Um, and um, if there is a diversion along the route, then customers need to know that. Uh, operators are encouraged to uh, update the route information if it's a planned diversion. So actually, you know, the, the route will be up to date, um, and in which case there's no need to announce the diversion. Um, and that will have a knock on effect on information that people have received prior to boarding for a journey planner or an app and things like that. So you know, encouraging that consistency across different challenges. But it's inevitable that um, a driver is going to go around a corner and find that the road is closed because the police have closed it for whatever reason or there's a burst water main or something like that. Um, and so um, in that situation, when an alternative route needs to be taken for um, even a short section, then um, passengers need to know about that. And so you need to announce that uh, the vehicle is going off route. 
um, and you also need to tell people when it's going to go back on route. Now, ideally, that is in time to allow people to get off at the bus stop before a diversion. Um, but sometimes that, of course, isn't going to be possible. Um, but if it can be done, then that's you know what needs to be done. Now, it's not um, dictated how this is information is provided. Uh, it could be, or, or triggered. It could be a driver pressing a button that just does a pre-recorded. You know, this bus is about to go on a diversion, uh, and another one when it finishes. It could actually be the driver stopping and making a uh, a manual announcement over the um, speaker system. Um, but in that case, then. Um, the uh, display system needs to be able to identify that and uh, also provide that information on the displays because some people are unable to hear and reliant on the visual information and the whole tenet of these regulations is to provide information in a consistent a manner as possible to as wide a group of people as possible so uh, if manual announcements are being made then uh, how that information is presented on screen also needs to be considered. Um, it's no good um, equipping a vehicle with audio and visual information and then forgetting about it. Um, so operators need to have a maintenance program in place. Um, there needs to be a way for drivers to uh, check the system, ideally before you know, first use type checks um, or you know, if something goes wrong en route uh, to alert somebody to fix it. And this is one area where um, we're expecting passengers to uh, raise issues, particularly with the naming of stops, for example, or the timing of announcements and things like that. So there needs to be some way of uh, passengers being able to raise an issue um, and it being dealt with. Um, and um, it's relatively easy for a driver to, you know, when they board a bus for the first time in the morning, uh, check that the display is powered up and he's showing something check that the uh, audio announcements are working because they're going to hear them. Um, but it's more challenging to test the hearing loop because uh, unless you've got a hearing aid with a T switch on, you're not going to know whether uh, the loop is working or not. And so um, the expectation is that um, as part of the making sure the system is working, a regular check is carried out that the loop is working through some form of tester. You can get uh, a range of different types of testers. You can get ones with pretty graphs and things like that that tell you how strong the signal is and the, the quality of the, of the signal being received. Um, down to really simple uh, little Walkman type devices that will receive the hearing loop signal. You put a pair of headphones in and you can hear what's coming over that. Um, uh, that's probably not something that a driver is going to do every day at first use, but it ought to be being done on a regular basis as part of a weekly check or something like that. Um, and if a fault is found on uh, any of the parts of the audio visual system, then they need to be fixed as quickly as possible because this is a requirement for the vehicle to have this kit on and working. And so um, there's an argument to say that if the AV system isn't working, uh, that's a vehicle off road uh, type failure. Um, so um, that ultimately will be between the operator and uh, DBSA as part of compliance checks and things like that. But that's going to be their base expectation um, that because this is a legal requirement, if it's not working in the same way that uh, a ramp up for wheelchair boarding on the vehicle isn't working, that should be a, uh, a vehicle off road type fault. 
So, um, because the regulations have been in place and people have started to implement um, systems, um, there's been a number of queries that the DFT and Arctic have received uh, over the last few months. Um, the most common are things like, do I need to fit forward facing displays on existing vehicles? Uh, some people are, um, that's great. Um, some people um, think that they do um, when they don't because the re regulations only require the forward facing displays for vehicles new after uh, October this year. Um, and um, that's when they're first used after October. So some operators have got vehicles in uh, backlogs at um, manufacturers that are going to need to be fitted, even though uh, the original order might not have uh, included the forward facing display. Um, so uh, you know, that's something to watch out if you've got vehicles on order. Um, Common question, oh, it's got to be LED, it's got to be TFT displays, LEDs are old hat and, you know, uh, the regulations need uh, TFT. No, they don't. You can meet the requirements with LED displays. Um, they are perfectly acceptable. Um, and, you know, for example, some operators are fitting LEDs as their forward facing displays for wheelchair users because actually it's easier to do that than put a TFT in in there in a safe manner. But the uh, rearward facing one uh, is a TFT, so you can mix and match as well. Um, a one of the more challenging um, things for operators is where there is a tour, so you might have an open top bus or closed top bus that runs round an area, sort of providing a tourist type service, um, information about you know, a city or or you know attractions and things like that. Um, but it's using normal bus stops and people can get on and off at will. It's not a tour in a in the um, a formal definition under the um, uh, Transport Act 20, no, 1980, whatever it is. Um, but, uh, you know, they're, they're branded as tours, but if they use normal bus stops and they're open to fair paying passengers, you can get on and off um, when they want, then you do have to comply with the regulations. But Sometimes these are providing commentary. You know, you're now passing the museum or this particular church, and you know, uh, so and so is buried here, and it was first built in whatever. Um, uh, you actually uh, need to work out how you can intertwine the uh, and the next stop type information uh, in between the the commentary and things like that in an appropriate way, and that's you know, causing some interesting thinking at the moment. The number of operators. Um, I've got a, a bus that's used on school services, so they're closed services, so I don't need that vehicle equipped. But um, if they're used on even one service that is uh, covered by the regulations, um, then the vehicle needs to be equipped and meet the requirements. It doesn't matter the fact that 99% of the time it's on a closed service. Um, it's the vehicle that matters, not the you know the type of service that's being used. Um, so uh, that's uh, got a few operators with some older vehicles normally uh, needing to fit when they didn't necessarily think they needed to. Um, and um, there are people that want to provide additional information beyond just that and the next stop is um, you know, points of interest light here for the the museum or you know uh, some form of attraction the zoo or whatever um, you will hear that on some services out there at the moment transport for london for example have some uh, points of interest information announced other operators have as well um, so you can do that um, and that's encouraged in the regulations, but you can't do that to the detriment of providing um, 
you know the core information and it's got to be provided in an audible and visual way you've got to have that consistency um, and um, what do I do if the system stops working well we've talked about that on the last slide you've got to be able to uh, fix it in a timely manner um, because it's a requirement for the vehicle to be in service so uh, that's few of the most common queries that we've been receiving. Um, so I don't know whether anybody's got any questions about the regulations before I go on to help and assistance, um, whether there's any support and help you might need or want. So while you're having a think um, the um, regulations um, can be quite challenging for operators to uh, achieve financially you know equipping a vehicle uh, is a reasonable amount of money um, and if you're a very small operator then uh, that's been identified as particularly challenging because you're probably not making as higher use of your vehicle as one of the major groups, for example. So uh, Artig has been given a grant by the Department of Transport to help the very smallest operators. And we're looking at operator when we talk about smallest operators with less than 20 vehicles that are in scope of the regulations uh, to help fund that. Uh, installation and first year of maintenance. Um, so uh, we will be launching that uh, soon um, in the next few weeks. Um, and there's a reasonable amount of money. So there's £4.6 million of funding available. Um, we think that that should be able to uh, support all of the operators that are in scope. Um, so fewer than 20 um, and when we open that then um, you know, I would encourage you to um, talk to your small operators if you're an authority, um, encourage them to apply um, and talk to us if you're not sure. Um, and uh, we're doing uh, a number of uh, road shows with CPT uh, over the next few weeks and hoping to do some with Album and Transport Scotland and Wales um, to help uh, raise awareness of the regulations and the grants as well. But I'd encourage you to, uh, once we announce the grant, I'll let it go out on as many channels as we can get. Um, and I'd encourage you to uh, to talk to your operators and get them uh, involved. Um, there is a um, special set of pages on the Artig website, artig.org.uk slash AIG with links to all of the official regulations and things like that. We've done a quick guide to them and we've got a uh, report on audiovisual equipment uh, you know, how you might go about specifying it, what sort of things are available and how uh, importantly you go about maintaining it and keeping it operating. Um, and um, the uh, slash AIG page will also be where the uh, grant application process will start from. So it's worth bookmarking it and passing it on to operators and you can pre-register an interest there so you get alerted directly um, when the grant becomes of a application process becomes available so has anybody got any questions no okay uh, in which case um thank you for your time this lunchtime. Um, if you want to get in contact with me or RT, contact details are on the screen if you didn't already have them. Um, and uh, thank you for attending and have a good 
rest of the day. Thank you for watching this Artig webinar. To find out more about Artig and our work, then please visit our website at rtig.org.uk. Thank you. Thank you.